Welcome back to TechForge, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and boy, do we have a video for you today. With the current release of the NVIDIA RTX series and the questions raised about its pricing, is it too expensive, is it worth buying? I've sort of come to the conclusion that for me personally, it is far too expensive. I can't even fathom spending that sort of money on a graphics card and that sort of performance jump. However, it does mean there are some terrific used bargains out there. I've got one right here beside me. We have one Radeon Vega 64 graphics card by Sapphire. So we're going to have a look at this today at 1440p performance. We're going to put it up against Hot Fuzz, which of course is the R5 1600 and the GTX 980 Ti overclocked to around about 1550 MHz. So of course it's going to be slightly difficult to put this inside the water-cooled loop without a lot of messing around and spending extra money on a water block, which I'm not going to do for testing. So we're going to throw it into Katie's rig right here, which is an i7-2700K with 16 gigabytes of RAM. It currently has a GDX 970 in it, so why not? We'll throw those benchmarks in as well for fun. I've also got Katie's 1440p monitor here since I'm still uh, back in the Stone Age on 1080p, so I'll be running it through this monitor. All the games will be tested at 1440p. We just want to see... For those of you out there running, say, 970, 980, 980 Ti, or R9 390, 390 those sort of equivalents, perhaps even GDX 1060, is it worth spending a little bit of money and getting one of these secondhand today? Released a little over 12 months ago in August 2017, the Vega 10 architecture was AMD's much anticipated and very much delayed replacement for the aging Fiji architecture which was released way back in 2015. Featuring a freshly minted 5th generation graphics core next design, Vega's many delays and Nvidia's dominant space in the top end GPU market meant a lot of expectation was placed upon Vega's shoulders. Gaming enthusiasts worldwide were hoping that AMD could break the stranglehold NVIDIA has had on the high-end gaming GPU market since the 980 Ti comfortably took care of business against Vega's forefather, the Fury and the Fury X. As it turned out, the Vega 56 and Vega 64, as the two cards were to become known as, fell somewhat short of these expectations. The Vega 56 managed to tail up its main rival, the GTX 1070, so much to the point NVIDIA had to release the 1070 Ti, which itself was only a lightly cut down GTX 1080. But the Vega 64, with its 4096 compute units and higher clocked 8GB of HBM2 memory, only managed to beat the GTX 1080 in a handful of games, and lost stunningly to the GTX 1080 Ti. Shortly thereafter, the Ethereum mining boot made the Vega cards rarer than hen's teeth, as aspiring crypto mining magnates cleared shelves of initial stock and then sent prices through the roof, paying anywhere upwards from 1500 to 2500 Aussie dollary dues at the height of the craziness. The combination of massive production delays giving Nvidia free reign at the high end of the market, unfavourable benchmarks, zero availability at MSRP and astronomical shelf prices meant only the very dedicated few were gaming on Vega GPUs after they were released. Now 12 months on and many having to drop out of the Ethereum game due to the increased difficulty, these once ungettable at a decent price GPUs are hitting the market. Here in Australia, we are seeing examples going for between $500 and $600 redos on the open market, which equates to around $360 to $440 Freedom Land fun bucks, or US dollars in financial parlance. This particular Sapphire version cost myself 520 Australian dollar reduce, which is around about the same price, maybe slightly higher than what you can find GTX 1080s on the open market here today. It's also possible to find GTX 1070s for around the $400 mark, 1070 Ti's for around 450, and the odd 980 Ti between 300 and 400 Australian bucks. So if you're looking for a strong 1440p resolution card, does the Vega 64 make sense? Let's stack it up against, say, my 980 Ti and find out. The two test systems we have today are not alike in any way. This is important to bear in mind as the results cannot be compared apples to apples. The Vega 64 will pair up with an i7-2700K clocked at 4.8 GHz, which is still very capable today of throwing out very high frame rates and should be more than enough for solid 1440p gameplay. The system has 16 gigabytes of DDR3 1600 MHz RAM and a 700 watt power supply, which is enough if the brand is reputable. 
The Vega 64 was running out of the box configuration balanced mode with an auto fan curve stock power limits and then again with a 50% power limit, 120 millivolt undervolt and a 115 megahertz boost to the HBM2. The fan curve was increased to 1800 to 3200 RPM to take care of all that heat. Oddly enough, the Green Team 980 Ti is finding itself in the trenches alongside the AMD R5 1600 CPU clocked at 4 GHz with 16 GB of DDR4 3333 MHz RAM. The GTX 980 Ti is of course liquid cooled which is very unfair in this fight considering how hot Vega likes to run. This allows the 980 Ti to overclock like a champ, hitting 1550 MHz on the core without any fuss an alarming 55% over the NVIDIA reference base clock, mind you, with an additional 400MHz on the DDR5 VRAM. Regarding the two test systems, the R5 1600 does have the slight advantage with its core and thread count over the 2700K, but not in a really meaningful way when it comes to gaming, as there are very few games out there where you're going to see a massive difference because you've either got 4 cores, 8 threads, or 6 cores and 12 threads. Where the 2700K hits back and hits back hard is its clock speed advantage. At 4.8 GHz, it's much higher than the 4 GHz that the R5 1600 is able to manage. Where the R5 1600 will claw back some advantage over the 2700K's clock speed is, of course, RAM speed. At 3333 MHz, it's more than twice as fast. And this should help level the playing field somewhat. We have four games and two synthetic benchmarks to tell the story today. I would love to have included more, but as it turns out, we've only got 120 gigabytes of free space on Katie's SSD, so I had to be very, very careful with the games I chose. So without any further rambling on, let's have a look at the benchmarks. Starting with the synthetics, 3D Mark V Strike Extreme saw the old Frankenmods GTX 970 score 6,000 points, which is actually pretty impressive for an older card. If you're not sure what the Frankenmods GTX 970 is, it's a card that we made some uh, little ghetto mods to in order to get it to clock a little bit higher. The video is on the channel somewhere, I'll try and link it in the description below. The 980 Ti returned over 8,600 and 9,800 points stock and overclocked and really flexed its muscles over its much smaller brother. The real heavyweight was the Vega 64, however, with 10,800 and almost 11,900 points stock and overclocked. I use that term loosely here as technically it was undervolted, but it did result in much higher clock speed, so I'm going with a term that will make more sense to more people. Next up in Superposition 1080p Extreme Settings, I know, I know, I said 1440p benchmarks, but Superposition has 1080p or 4K, and the 970 just doesn't have enough VRAM for 4K. Besides, the 1080p Extreme Setting is far harsher than what the 4K can dish out. Results-wise, the GTX 970 tanked completely, offering a stuttery mess in only 2200 points. Very much out of its league here. The 980 Ti gave us 3700 and 4180 points, and the Vega 64 again owned the party with 4400 and 4860 respectively, throwing its weight around with all of those compute units. But synthetics are only part of the story. Yes, they are reliable for the most part in getting accurate and repeatable results. They look great in benchmarking records but they rarely correlate directly to games, so now onto those of which I just spoke. What's a benchmark sesh without ashes of the singularity, am I right? Ran in DirectX 12 across the board in the crazy 1440p preset to put as much load onto the GPUs as possible. The 970 ran in a 30 FPS result, which was more than I'd expected. 980 Ti churned out a solid 46 and 50 FPS respectively stock and overclocked, but it was Vega 64 who exceeded the pack with 52 and then 55 FPS once overclocked. Ashes is a really hard benchmark, so well done the 980 Ti and Vega 64. The 970 does get the tried very hard award. Next up, racing game Assetto Corsa, an Nvidia sponsored title that is included to balance out Ashes, which was sponsored by AMD. Assetto is gorgeous even at 1080p and at 1440p with all the sliders set to stun, it was harder to recall a four-wheel racing game looking better. The 970 handled the game at this resolution with a plom, returning 62 FPS average and playing quite smoothly as well. This meant the 980 Ti, of course, was able to shoot even higher, hitting 95 and 107 FPS average when overclocked, really showing how well optimized for Nvidia hardware the game is. Unfortunately for Vega 64's firepower, much of it was wasted, as it could only muster 96 and 105 FPS to be within margin of error of the much older Maxwell card. 
Next up was something relatively new and happy to play on NVIDIA and AMD cards. Warhammer Vermintide 2 is another stunning game that is just amazing to play at 1440p. The 970 actually managed 51 FPS and with some sacrifices in the settings menu, could be perfectly playable. The 980 Ti gobbled up the goblins with 76 and 86 FPS averages while the Vega 64 managed to eke out a small win with 85 and 90 FPS averages respectively. I was rather surprised with the Vega results here with the stock and OC results being so close together but this may be down to a game engine or perhaps even a system bottleneck holding it back a little. Lastly is the Evergreen benchmarking classic Metro Last Light Redux set at 1440p maximum settings. Hammering GPUs since September 2014, the Last Light benchmark still makes even high-end graphics cards sweat, so it was fitting to go out this way. The 970 was not surprisingly unplayable and way out of its depth with a lowly 30 FPS average. The 980 Ti was able to salvage a result for the green team with 47.53 FPS results, almost taking it to the Vega 64 which managed 53 and 57 FPS averages which is quite remarkable for the overclocked 980 Ti to come so close to a much more powerful GPU. So there we have it guys and gals, a very unscientific look at where Vega 64 stacks up to the GTX 970 and 980 Ti. Yes, the test rigs played a part in the results and there's no real way to make this a proper apples to apples comparison. But I'm pretty certain if you could manage to swap the cards in the rigs, the results might be pretty similar. When it's all you've got on hand, you've just got to go with what you got. And I promise as soon as I get some sort of money, I will go out and build myself a proper test rig. So do I think Vega 64 makes a compelling case for 1440p gaming? Not right now. There are much cheaper options that are nigh on or faster than it, being a 980 Ti overclocked or a 1070 overclocked will do just as well pretty much, or a 1080 even will beat it in most games and run a lot cooler and quieter and less power. But what if you have a FreeSync or FreeSync 2 monitor? Well, that changes the equation a little bit. At that point, you have only really two options at 1440p, and that is the Vega 56 and the 64. Don't get me wrong, the RX 580 will put up a little bit of a fight at 1440p, depending on the settings you've got, but it won't do it in all the games. So if you're really looking for some strong performance, I suggest skipping the RX 580 and heading straight to Vega. Therefore, I could only really recommend the Vega architecture if you're gaming at 1440p on a FreeSync monitor, and even then, I don't think I would recommend the 64. I don't think the performance gap between the 56 and the 64 is large enough to justify the price. You could pick up a Vega 56 for somewhere between 400 and 450 Australian dollars, and it will overclock just that little bit better because it's not producing as much heat, and it will give you almost identical performance in a lot of games. Don't get me wrong though, the Vega 64 is not a bad card. It is a fantastic compute card. If you can utilize the power in this card, it's something crazy like 13 plus giga teraflops. Like it's a ridiculous amount of compute power in this sort of card. If you can utilize that sort of power, whether it's in some sort of rendering program or you know, some sort of workstation work, then this is a phenomenal card. It is an out and out compute card. But of course, it was let down by internal decisions at AMD. The decision to prioritize Navi over Vega really hit this card hard. You can tell in the power states, the fact that you can undervolt it and it runs faster. They really never got enough time and enough people together in one place to put together a proper gaming card. When it's stuck with a reference cooler, the Vega 64 is very much limited by its capacity to handle the thermals that are going on underneath here. It downclocks with heat and power draw much like Pascal, but because it is really an unfinished architecture, to say it politely, it doesn't have the same finesse, that same power efficiency that Pascal has to be able to do that properly. This means the reference cards don't really have any overclocking headroom at all in them. To get anywhere near the advertised boost clocks, we had to pull 120 millivolts out of the core to get the temperatures down to get the clock speeds to come up. And in order to get it to stay there, to keep it at the 75 degree target, we had to have the blower fan punching out 3000 RPM, which was a novelty at first, but it wears thin very quickly. One thing though that was evident straight away, as soon as you pick the card up, was the build quality. It's staggeringly well built. 
every single part of it feels like premium quality material and it is so bloody solid. The backplate itself really is a masterpiece, understated but that cutout is superbly fitted. I'm really just gutted with the overall execution of the architecture. This is a card you could fall in love with. It's a nice looking card, it's very understated, it is so well made and I'm so thankful that AMD were pushing the boundaries by including HBM2. It's, it's something you only really got on the higher end cards. So, thanks. <laughs> but it's not a card nobody should own, quite the opposite really. It would really be a fine addition to your gaming rig under the right circumstances, i.e. you want to play at a higher resolution and you have a FreeSync monitor. So in summary, Vega was ultimately sacrificed at the altar of necessity by AMD. They just didn't have the resources to develop two different GPU architectures at once and they just knew in their heart of hearts that Navi is going to be the gaming GPU since this is the compute GPU. I really feel for Raja Kaduri and his team. They must have put in so much work with so many little resources and they did their best to put out something that could take the fight up to Nvidia. And when you really think about the magnitude of what they achieved with what little they had, it's actually kind of impressive. I can only hope that sacrificing Vega for Navi was worth it. And AMD, if you're listening, if Navi fails, Radeon and AMD fail. Only time will tell if Vega was worth sacrificing. And on that note, thanks for watching the Vega 64 video. I'm your host, Nath, and we'll see you in the next one.